everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, Friday afternoon of this uh, series of the seminar we hear from the CRT network. And I'm particularly pleased that this, this uh, today for two reasons. The first one is because the speaker is here in person, which is, I know, I don't even remember the last time that we, we managed to do this. So, you know, but uh, we hope that, that we will have more in the future. And the second reason is because of the speaker actually, you know, this is a part of his, uh, he spent a part of his uh, sabbatical in, in, in CLT. So he was our guest in the, in the last uh, five, six months. Oh, yeah. months, yes. And we were very pleased to have him here. And so this is some sort of a farewell uh, seminar that you know he will uh, wrap up what uh, you know the, the results of his uh, sabbatical, and uh, we are very pleased to, to have him with us. So uh, Christoph uh, 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 Heitz, which is uh, the, the speaker today, is, he started his career as a physicist, which is a common uh, you know uh, apparently is a common uh, tutors for for, uh, for for everyone from for many people in the network. Uh, you know, he, with a PhD in theoretical physics at the University of Freiburg, and then uh, he moved to Zurich, where he is uh, his current is, uh, after a period uh, in, in, in a company, which you know, he learned many things uh, that uh, he is applying this, uh, you know, in his uh, current work today. And uh, without further ado, you know, uh, we are very happy to have you with us, and uh, you know, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you. So thank you for this kind introduction. And uh, by the way, uh, also uh, really, really thank, uh, thank you for having me here uh, host for the last four months. Uh, great time here in Venice. Uh, of course, one part is the city, the other part is really, uh, let's say, I also had a productive time in terms of research and the things that I wanted to pursue here uh, in uh, also in cooperation. So thank you, all of you. Um, and uh, for today, I want to um, dig a bit into this field of algorithmic fairness, AI decision-based, uh, data-based decision-making, social justice. And I'm doing this uh, because this is, uh, let's say, the, the thing that I have focused on the last four months uh, during my stay here. Um, it is not so much about, let's say, uh, the latest... Um, peculiarities of our research that we are doing there, uh, even though we have now a, I would say a history of three years uh, really working um, hard in that field with, with a large team, um, but uh, it's more meant as, a, as an introduction um, also for people outside of the field, and I know that there are some business-related uh, people as well this year, so I, I, I will not be become too much too technical, so uh, it should be kind of all of you uh, in this relatively new field of research um, and um, which is actually boosting up uh, in, in the last years uh, and, and months. Uh, so uh, let's say my goal is at the end that you have a kind of overview of what the, what the topics. Uh, they are a bit of a structure because uh, uh, as for probably as uh, uh, for all new fields that are uh, Coming up, there is a lot of confusion. Confusion also, there are different terms used for the same things, the same terms used for different things. Uh, so, so it's kind of hard to, to understand the basic lines. And, and my ambition today is to provide you with some. When I prepared the presentation, I realized that it was actually not that easy. So, I hope I can live up to my promise. Uh, and uh, forgive me if not. Um, but uh, we have. Maybe. Um, it was in uh, the year 2016 where an article appeared in the uh, American Journal um, written by people from a watchdog organization who cared, a journalist, investigative journalist who cared for uh, the for algorithms and what algorithms do with our society, and uh, those journalists had a closer look at a, at a system called Compass, um, which has been already used uh, for for many years in the American criminal system, and uh, this was a relatively new system, a data-based system, 
something that we would call AI probably today. Uh, and uh, what you see here is what this, uh, this system does. Uh, this system creates um, a, risk for, uh, a risk score for people who are in prison. And uh, this risk score can, score can range from zero to 10. And uh, what it means uh, is that it, it, it gives the probability that someone would commit another crime if this person would be released from prison. So the number 10 means there's a 100% probability that this person uh, will commit a crime and zero is a uh, risk. So high, high numbers are high risks. Um, and what you see here are two, uh, uh, two people that have been assigned a score like that. Dylan Fudget with a low risk score of three and his Bernard Parker with a low risk score of 10. Uh, now this, this, uh, this uh, at the basis of this tool, is a software that has been developed by, uh, I think, a statistics professor at one of the universities and someone from the criminal system. They, they, they developed that together, put it into a package and sold it as a private company uh, to courts, to, uh, to all, all uh, different uh, justice institutions in the United States. And by that time, um, when, when this investigation was made, uh, roughly one million people already had been uh, judged with the system. The system is based on data that is available, social demographic data, such as age, uh, 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 gender, um, and, and also, let's say, the, the personal background, the criminal history, of course, but then also uh, those people had to fill out a questionnaire that was, that was specifically made for giving some information about predicting the risk of the So, um, um, and, and as I said, this was huge, uh, widely used. So those journalists now um, tried to assess whether this system worked or not. Um, and um, what, what they did is they had uh, public data available from um, uh, people that have been assessed, and the part, and, and then from those people who then have been released from prison. And we're speaking here. Um, um, for example, for cases when, when people are waiting for their final trial uh, and, and they're, they're released because there's no reason to do something um, bad after the trial, uh, for example. So uh, for there, are, there have been some observation data from people that have been released. Uh, so there was a, a part of the data that was said whether or not they actually committed the crime. So the, the, there was an observation that can, could be um, related to what the tool is predicting. Um, so they, they investigated that and what they found out is that this tool actually has duration limits. Uh, this, this is what they found out. Uh, and in the next slide here, uh, you see one part of that and I just try to, uh, you see my mouse here probably. Um, this is one part of the analysis that, that they did. And uh, a specific, um, a specifically important number is, is, is this one. So what they, they looked at people that have been labeled high risk, high risk means, if I remember correctly, fairly seven or something, um, but did not re-offend. So the tool said, those are bad guys, so to say, but then um, um, when they got proven on that, uh, they did bad at least. So, so there was no, um, so for those high risk, uh, uh, high risk labeled people that did not offend, that did not re-offend, um, we uh, the, the data showed that um, that it was um, uh, twenty three percent of for, for whites, but forty four percent for blacks, which meant uh, that the, the black people actually have been assigned a higher risk than the, 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 the thought, right? So, so this was a, anyway, a misclassification. So the, 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 the tool said this is a high risk, but then nothing happened. But this, uh, this error was not distributed equally between uh, those two, uh, two races. And um, this uh, observation then led to a huge debate in the States. Uh, one, uh, and, and there was really a lot of uh, a lot of discussion about it, public discussion. And one of the the, the consequences of that was that this, the companies, private companies, 
company called North Point had to shut down their operations. The tool still exists, but, but under, under the name. And so the brand was. Uh, so this was, uh, this was a, uh, let's say, this, and it's still probably the most discussed case in, in what we call now algorithmic fairness or algorithms that are used um, to, um, to predict something, uh, to make decisions on, and that might create some social, um, social injustice. Uh, there are, but, but this is not the only one. And, uh, uh, Here's a, here's a study that unfortunately is only available in German, as far as I know. This was a, an attempt um, um, two years ago, to, published in 2019, of a, a, um, a German researchers who tried to systematically collect documented cases of discrimination created by algorithms. And in this book, um, he, he collected the 47 already implemented systems, the systems already in place and being used like the Compass one um, that actually had led to documented discrimination. And those, uh, those uh, systems um, are, uh, that he, he found there, we are from all areas of our life, starting from our work life, but also private life um, and, and medicine, uh, traffic, uh, traffic cases, he found cases in the social care system, uh, uh, other cases in the education system, and of course, law, uh, police and law enforcement, and the Compass was one uh, also. But it, there, there are also others, for example, uh, predictive police cases. So uh, we are now living in, a, and what this shows is that, that this danger of algorithms um, um, impacting our lives is not a theoretical one or something that we might care in principle. This is something that is already implemented in place today in nearly all. Yeah. Sh should I stand a bit more or put it narrow to me? Is it this one or that one? <laughs> Is it better? Yeah. That's okay. I will talk some. I mean, I'll continue talking some nonsense. And, but but you, you can probably give it. Yeah. No, no, no. This is not an algorithm watch report. I know. This is an older one. Okay, so what we learned from that, it is, it is already here, it is relevant, and it happens, obviously. And then what I want to, 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 uh, to, um, to then uh, now um, work a bit, when I, when I work through that field a bit, uh, my goal is also to show you why this is so omnipresent, why algorithms are per se unfair and, and create social, social justice, and uh, we should see that in a few minutes. So this is the program for today, AI database decisions and fairness. I just want to, to uh, let's say, describe the arena in which kind of environment does this happen. Um, I'll uh, come uh, comment on this relationship um, between, if I only see the, uh, is it better now? Oh, you don't see, yeah. for me it's better. What is the relationship between machine learning, um, AI tech, so the technical part of AI, or part of the technical part of AI, social justice, um, and um, I'll a bit explain the difference between prediction, what's, what's made by, by machine learning, and then the decision. Um, I'll comment a bit on what 
pairs is, how we could define that, and how we do define that in machine learning, and how we measure fairness. Um, you heard about create fairness. It can be created. So good, good message. It is not that often created a bad message, but it's a first field to improve. Uh, um, <clears throat> Room to improve, and then uh, an outlook to some ethical questions as implications from these insights here. So, the arena. Um, we're speaking about decision systems, and we are not speaking about general decision systems, but about systems that take decisions on individuals, on humans, on an individual basis. Um, this is something that has exploded in terms of applications in the last 10 years because so much digital data is around of people, of course, and this data is uh, exploited. And one of those uh, exploitation areas is how to make better decisions. Because now we know more than we know ever knew before about people. Um, this knowledge is uh, ingrained in some data, and this data is used to Decisions. And here uh, we have seen this decision of uh, whether or not release someone from prison. Here's another decision um, that I will use as an example also. Uh, uh, consider the, the case of a bank who wants uh, who gives loans for, for people that are wanting to buy a home, a house. So this is a, a standard decision we all know about, but this is uh, it's the same time of type of decision problem. So um, is a kind of algorithm, and as you see here, with a defined uh, start, with a defined end, uh, it begins typically with an application of, a, of an uh, applicant to the bank. I want to have a billion Swiss francs for my house here. Uh, and what a bank does is it checks whether the ap applicant will pay back this loan plus the interest. So, this is the central question. And if this question can be answered with yes, then the bank will give the loan uh, happily, as this is the way of money. Uh, if not, then uh, they will be good. So, so basically, there's a decision, and this decision is to be made. Um, and uh, this decision here is based on something that is not known at the point of decision making. It's not known whether this specific person will pay back. So that means, uh, but still we have to make a decision. And, and, and the proxy for that is, is uh, something um, that, that we call a prediction. Why do we make a prediction or not? Case, and depending on that prediction, um, the bank makes the decision. This is, this is the game. Uh, and this has been done for centuries, actually. Now it is being done with data analysis, data science, with uh, machine learning. Now the, the, the fairness issue comes in here as the question, does the implementation of such, such a system lead to social injustice? And uh, for uh, being a bit more concrete, the social injustice is mainly framed as the question, are there social groups that are systematically disadvantaged? For example, is it the case uh, that women have uh, much less chances to get uh, such a such a loan uh, in an unjustified way, in an unjust way. So this is a central question that we look at, um, and uh, so this is part of, of, of the arena here as well. Now let's dig a bit into the logic of those that kind of problems. And what you see here is uh, this decision system here uh, at, at the top here. This is the blue box, um, it starts with data that we have from, from individuals and it ends with the decision. Now this process is not arbitrary. Uh, so it starts with a decision maker, for example, the bank, uh, with a goal. This decision maker has to take a decision, but this decision, that there are better and worse decisions. So the goal of a bank would be to make a, a good selection such that uh, and, and, and measure whether the selection of applicants is good uh, in terms of how, many, how much money you will earn with this business of applicants. Uh, so there's a, this, uh, so there's a business goal here, for example, or in general, a decision. Then we have um, 
uh, we apply this kind of decision system to many cases, to, not, not only to one case, to many cases repeatedly in our, the bank um, uh, examples are the, the applicants for those loans. The third ingredient here is that those decisions are based on something that is not known at the time of the decision. And in the bank case, it will be uh, this uh, question whether or not this, this person will pay back. In uh, hiring, for example, is the question whether or not this person will do a great job for the company and be successful in put the company forward. Uh, in in uh, applications to a, let's say, the renowned study program is the question whether or not this, this student will, will do a good job. And not only, uh, let's say, uh, those to understand this program, but also be successful in that and so on. So it's always the case that if you want to make a decision based on something you actually do not know. And the, the new thing, and why this is so, so many let's say, dynamics in that field is that now we have data, uh, we have uh, digital data that we can use for kind of um, making something that we call a, uh, that we call a prediction, right? The data, the, the data that we have, uh, allows us now to predict uh, those unknown quantity that's typically called Y, it's not a Y's use in the literature. Um, and we can, that, can do that based on the, on the data better. At least this is the hope, I promise we can do that better. We, so uh, we take this data and we make something like a prediction. So the prediction can be just binary. Say, so, well, okay, this person will pay. For it. So this is. Kind of simple thing, and of course we know this is not true because we just can tell that. And then a more advanced thing is uh, we give a score, we calculate something like a score, and and the score should um, uh, be something like probability. So so the, the best thing basically that we can do is to decide the probability. So I don't know whether you will pay back, but but I think you're a person with an eighty percent chance, and if I take uh, 100 of persons like that, 80 of them will then pay back. But this is, a, this is the knowledge that is needed for decision. And then, uh, so, so and, and, and that means here what, what we always have here is a prediction model. We take the data, we make a prediction of the unknown variable or feature, and this prediction, of, of the, this prediction is then used to inform a decision algorithm. In the bank case, it's totally, totally trivial to how to do that. I mean, you can calculate if, if you know this, this probability, you can you can factor in interest rate, other economic factors, and you can decide whether this is a proper business or not. And this gives a threshold. Um, and this kind of threshold rule, rule is very often used and very often by the solution. So you can imagine of having this probability. Uh, Putting that in a rule, beta and rule for the decision beta, decision beta, this is typical, as I said, decision. And of course, this decision algorithm um, it, uh, is, is influenced by the goal of the decision. So it's an economic environment and a lot of other factors. But at the end, a decision. So we have seen that, that prediction here is a key element. This is re really important to understand. It's, uh, we had decision problems in all the history of humankind, uh, but uh, and, and prediction basically was a part of that. It's very, very important. But, but now we, we do that with a different, um, with different uh, methods. So the decision algorithm coming, the transfer the individual data to the individual decision, uh, consists of those two steps, prediction of a probability, for example, to pay back, and then uh, this decision rule, and for example, if this probability is higher than uh, the threshold, then my decision will be one. And, the other. and this is exactly what, what, what this is, is what this compass takes uh, also. So what we see, this is low risk score and high risk score. This okay. So um, the classical, the old style of doing uh, this prediction is to, is to do simple rules based on experience. This is how we grew up, uh, what we do, still do in a lot of areas of our life. 
Um, but today, machine learning and artificial intelligence entering this field. Um, and the, the basic idea here is, as you all know, we have some historical data where some patterns are in, probably, we try to, to find it out. Um, and uh, understanding those patterns, and using them for decisions. What we see is very often that this is really much better than we could better now in terms of goal of the decision making. This is important to see. So this is this goal. I want to earn more money, for example. This can be better. This is this is why there is so much striving force behind all that. This is why they why they they come up right now because now we have to to, uh, to use them to increase our uh, goal, our search for. Our Okay, so the decision maker um, um, optimize his utility. So this is this is basically the, the rational behind the decision or the important decision. At the same time, while doing this, he creates some impact on the life of the affected subjects. And this is what, what we look at when we um, so and and um, uh, we look at that um, under a, a, a specific perspective, namely the perspective of the impact in terms of social justice. Is, 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 it, is it a case that this decision making you know, repeatedly, repeatedly, a lot of people, uh, um, is, it, is it a case that this decision creates social injustice? This is, the, this is what algorithmic fairness is about. Now, um, the term fairness here um, has been studied under different perspectives, and the much and the most prominent one, let's say that, that the one that ninety five percent of people are using lying is what we call group fairness. So the, the question here is uh, what I said before: Are there any social groups that are systematically social groups? It's what we call group fairness, and uh, this, of course, is very near to what you know under the term of discrimination. Is there a or sexual discrimination. So typically, it's uh, reality identified with discrimination. A lot of others just other fairness concepts that I have in gray here because I don't want to dig into them is uh, something that's called individual fairness, uh, dealing about uh, uh, comparing two different uh, individuals and, and the question of whether the decision is fair. Those two, uh, and something that is called counterfactual fairness, which is more than um, So we'll leave that out so, and focus on group fairness. Um, so we have those groups, those social groups. And fairness basically then means um, the, the impact um, of, of the, those decisions um, are. Um, are viewed as, as something that even uh, either benefits those individuals or harm those, those individuals. It doesn't, doesn't matter what, but something that is e either desirable or we don't need to have. Uh, and uh, the fairness, fairness means and that uh, for the two groups, that kind of good, if you want to, is distributed equally. So it's, it's not the case that, let's that, uh, uh, that say, men get more of the benefit than women. This is what I want to hear. Concerned about when we speak about fairness. So we have something like a benefit or harm, and we have salient social groups. So typically, those the groups that are uh, looked at are defined uh, by human rights uh, and, and the anti discrimination laws in the country. So this is this, this, this uh, set of new things like. Uh, like gender, sex, race, uh, is it uh, belief, belief, uh, uh, for example, uh, political views? So, so this, this is this is what we what we uh, mean. Salience of the group, but this can also be um, 
combinations of them. For example, might it be the case that uh, that old women with a low income, with a, with a low income, are systematically worse off compared to this? So this is something. Um, now, benefit and harm um, um, connected to those decisions is something that is now new in this bridge. Right? This, 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 this has nothing to do with the decision problem of the decision maker. Okay? I mean, the bank doesn't care. If they found out a rule that, that, makes, that allows them to make a lot of money, and one effect of that is that, is that the social group just wouldn't have any loans. I mean, this, this, this is basically not of an issue for the loan seeking. Um, and, and this is why uh, it is uh, typically uh, not uh, being considered, and it's not uh, searched for, it's not assessed. So uh, this is one of the reasons why it's okay. So okay, so we have to distinguish between, between those, two, uh, those two things. And uh, in, um, um, there is, there is a, a, let's say, a, a current theme that I observe in discussions with data scientists or machine learners. Um, when, when I talk with them about this, then, then one uh, immediate reply is, hey, the, the reason why I build is because I want this I want a, a discrimination. Um, but this is a discrimination um, in terms of the decision makers, decision barrier. And this is not to say uh, then the question I speak of here, right? So, so uh, this are, these are really two things that have to distinguish very clearly um, mentally and conceptually for understanding this. And another uh, um, term that, that, that Appears very often that called this algorithmic bias. Algorithmic bias is I, I would identify that basically. Um, here's a, is a definition that we found on Wikipedia that says the term algorithmic bias describes systematic and repeatable errors that create unfair outcomes, such as privilege or abuses over others. So you see here again that the groups are appearing uh, something like uh, unfair outcomes. So we care about uh, the, the consequences of the decision. Um, and it's something that says systematic. It's, that, that's an important point. Uh, we never talk about individual decisions. Um, algorithms that make a prediction do make errors as humans do. This is not the, the point of uh, of discussion. So this is just a boundary condition. Um, any any prediction system, not the purple. Uh, the, the question is more, um, if we live with a specific sort of unperfectness, what is the result? And uh, uh, let's say caring uh, or, or, or uh, uh, accepting that kind of errors leads us naturally to this requirement to have a Look for a systematic. So, uh, systematic means, for example, averaged over a group. A, a group. This is what's typically uh, said. I come to this uh, point of how do we could measure fairness. Uh, so fairness is, uh, as as uh, as we said, has, has to do with disadvantages for for social groups. Unfairness is a systematic disadvantage for one social group. Um, as I said, not focusing. Decisions and systematic uh, effects are typically expressed by probabilities or by fractions. And a, a, a typical question that we might ask, might ask here for this back example, is the fraction of male applicants who are granted a loan the same as the equivalent fraction of female? Is it the same, or is it the case that eighty percent of women would get a loan and ten percent would not? Now we we, dis we can discuss. Uh, reasons that might justify that, but but just this is the kind of question that needs to fraction or do it from the perspective of the individual. You could ask, uh, and this is the same question, just uh, expressed a bit differently: Is the probability of, a, of a, an average male applicant to receive the loan the same as the probability? What is probability? Just uh, expressing. 
And in the following, uh, I just uh, make I try to be uh, simple here. Uh, we just select two arbitrary social groups, which is men and women, uh, male and female, and we assume that we are now concerned with these two groups. But you can, for all other groups, of course, also for two groups. How could we measure fairness? And um, the, the, the literature now has uh, evolved in the last years. And one of this involvement is that people suggest a very different ways of measuring fairness. I can't come back to that to the point is like that. Uh, but there are, uh, if, if you look at the literature and try to sort that uh, out, there are, uh, then you will find that there are basically three established fairness techniques. So uh, ways of defining fairness uh, specifically. Uh, and those are the three that you didn't see here on the slide. The first one says something like, um, I want to have the same chances for, for example, mission to a study program, I want the boys and girls with the same chance to get accepted. And I, you could express that here in terms of probabilities, for example, you have here the, the men and the women, and when you are looking at the probability that the decision is a positive one, uh, and we look, we look at its probability for men, and we ask whether, whether or not the probability of a positive decision for men is the same. So, men have a 30% acceptance rate. This should also be for, for women. Uh, this is called statistical parity, or another way, another way uh, expression that is used is independence. So, basically, the decision is independent of the gender. Um, so, this is one, one established feature. Another one which looks very similar, we, all, we also have the probability for men and for women, is um, uh, takes it a different angle. For example, for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for this compass case, um, uh, when it's about uh, releasing someone from prison, uh, out of prison, um, you could say, well, there are the, the bad guys, and the good guys, and the good guys are that they kind of deserve the. the they're maybe error or whatever, but those are good guys. So, so they deserve uh, being let go. And for the bank example, you might say, well, people who are really honest and paying back their debts, they deserve to get to get it. Um, so this is uh, this is our decisions to create uh, situations uh, that are such that um, from a moral perspective, we would say. That there is some some element of merit in most of those cases. Uh, some people deserve a, a, a positive decision for for study program. Like the, the, the clever, the smart ones deserve to be. So um, if, you, if you now take that and, and, and try to apply that, then you are maybe not interested in in, in this first measure. You say, well, uh, that there are um, women. And men, but maybe the mixture of, of deserving people is different well, uh, for those two groups. So it does not, I don't care about, about that. I look just for the for the for this fraction of people who actually deserve deserve something. So uh, and, and this this leads to a, a bit uh, a different expression here. So I look at the probability for a positive decision uh, for men, given that their unknown property is. So now this is known for the decision making, but a posteriori, if you can often measure that, and this was needed in the compass. Observing those um, people. And uh, basically, this uh, is the difference between those two probabilities is what we have seen before in this table, which created all of these problems, this compass. Uh, so this is called equal opportunity or equal odds or separation. Um, and uh, this is the second uh, of those three categories. And then there's another category which is kind of different, but also uh, and, and also looks at probabilities, but equality of probabilities. And this comes from machine learning. Um, so when you have a, a, a predictor say, well, here I assign 50% to, to this group of people, percent of having property, um, then you might ask uh, when, uh, whether you, if you take all those people with 
this score or this probability and and now observe whether or not actually these people or how many of them actually uh, then have this property and you can ask well uh, are those actually percent or more or less this is something that is called a calibration in machine learning um, but in terms of fairness you ask more is the percentage of women that have this uh, this probability the same then for as for men that's because everybody of them has assigned the probability of 50 percent but if you if you have a situation where uh, all the people who got assigned this probability Take all of them, but you take all men, then yes, for 40 percent, for the women, 60 percent, something is wrong. Take then this, this score and make a decision on that, probably to the science. So, this is the rational, and it's not even this is called well calibration <clears throat> in some from some authors. Uh, this is basically, uh, let's say, the zoo of uh, the core of the zoo of. It's not immediately clear, for example, how the, the last one uh, relates to the first two ones. This is, this is really an open question that we're trying to, to, to understand right now. And, uh, it's, uh, it's really good. This is not exhaustive. I, I simplified it very much. Basically, what you see here in the next slide is. Yeah, there's a table from a, from a, from a publication in uh, 2018. Those are just 20 or something, right? So uh, basically, um, IBM and other companies, but IBM also has created a tool that's called Fairness 360 or something, and they implement the more than 80 fairness uh, measures that have been suggested. So we have those 80. Um, and um, uh, so in, in, in 2018, this was probably the first time where this came, became so totally apparent to the community where Arvind Naraya uh, had a, a really a tutorial that kind of became famous in the previous frontier, where he's, he just explained 21 different things. What are we going to do with it? But since then, it has expanded. So, so there are all of those definitions around and really open questions. Now, an important thing is that they are mutually exclusive. If, if, if you do some trick, so such that one of those fairness measures is, is fulfilled, you can be sure that the others are not. Which, which is kind of a very frustrating insight, um, and, but you can prove that. It's the case under, uh, let's say, very weak conditions. There are some special cases. Or at the same time, a typical realistic So that, that means, well, there's some, some we have at least a good decision. The question is how to do that, and I'll come to that in a few minutes. But just to, to give you an, an idea of, of how that plays out, why, why is this the case? Um, let's consider a case, a simple case. But one that you might find in practice, we have this decision model. And now assume that this prediction model is a very good one. This has a predictor, uh, the best predictor. Think of it, it, it outputs a probability, uh, and this probability is the true probability. So every, every probability is really true probability. So it is calibrated, it's well calibrated, it works for men, uh, equally uh, for women. So it's best. Thing. So one of those fairness criteria. So this is the best that you can have in the prediction. Um, and then uh, you have something like the bank example where, where the goal of the decision maker actually leads to a threshold. So we say, oh, there is some threshold and uh, uh, everything above, above will be accepted. Refused. And now um, I, I have uh, here invented a kind of a population. We have males and we have females, so everybody uh, every triangle here is a person, and they are uh, now sorted according to their probabilities, zero to one. So this is a, a male person with a high probability, for example, a female person. Um, 
Now, what happens if the decision maker now takes a decision? And um, the typical way is the decision maker just ignores those facts. Uh, so, um, and then he knows, I mean, this can be mathematically clear, that he just has to apply this threshold rule. And this is a, so there is, is one threshold. You can set that and you can vary the thresholds and calculate how much money you will make with that. So there is an optimal. optimal. So let's, let's assume this is the optimal. Um, now, this is the, 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 the optimal, let's say, the optimal decision that the decision maker can make in terms of his system. But let's look for fair, fairness here. Um, for example, we can look for the acceptance rates that we call statistical parity. We take all those people here, and now we look uh, at them for the males. We have 11 males here, if you count them. Um, six of them are accepted. So the acceptance rate for males is six um, for 11 is percent. For the females, we have three accepted uh, out of nine. So this is a 33. And you see here that obviously there's a large discrepancy. So from a good from a perspective of statistical parity, it's a good We could also look at, at this, uh, this equal opportunity, the second one. Uh, and here I have shown you the, 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 the ground truth here, the same people, but the, the, the solid ones are the ones who actually pay back. So we think we can look a bit in the future uh, and the light ones are the ones who do not pay back. You see, people with a high score might default, of course, and people with a low score might call back, but the, the density of the not paying back people. Um, Okay, this is the this this was the, the optimum threshold, and uh, now now when we look for the deserving people, uh, we only have to look at the solid ones. So there, are, for the men, we have six of, of them. Four of them are accepted, two are refused. So we have an acceptance rate of most deserving individual of sixty-six percent, and for the females, we have two out of five. Um, again, equal opportunity. You can easily imagine. Uh, that uh, in nearly all situations we have exactly that situation. So fulfilling one of those criteria automatically leads to a failure for the others, and this can be changed. Um, now, one there, can we create fairness? Was the first question. How could we create fairness? And one of the standard methods um, that is that are su suggested is uh, to use group specific thresholds. Now let's say we look at the statistical parity, and now we say, well, we don't uh, take one, one threshold for all. We take a threshold for men and women. So we have to. Uh, we still can, uh, and then we want to use this group such to create statistical parity. And for example, this. What you see here, this creates statistical parity here for the women here. Sorry. So we accept five males out of 11 and four females out of nine. And when we calculate this, nearly three. So statistical parity is fulfilled. And, and the way how we would do it as a, as a decision maker who cares for fairness is to. to, um, to Reframe the optimization problem. The optimization problem is now not not longer op, uh, op, uh, just fit, it, but it's optimized for profit under the constraint of a well specified fairness. This is the best way that you can do as a decision maker when caring. Uh, there's a solution here. Maybe what the lady find, find those those uh, those optimal thresholds. Or fulfill the statistical parity. Now, if you if we go back to the other slides, we easily see that uh, still the other the other fairness criteria is, is not 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 that important, right? So, so we can either do statistical parity or okay. So this is made as for uh, according to people uh, the, the thing that the pieces that we discussed. So far, maybe the, the most important results of the research of the last years, not of my research, but of the community. Um, 
the, the way how uh, the decision makers perspective and the fairness perspectives can be combined is to, 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 uh, to find an optimization process. Yes, the decision maker uh, sh should be able to optimize his or her path under this constraint. For that, we need to uh, a well-defined transcript and we saw about that which one to choose. Um, now we can we can think about utility functions that are used in practice, and for for, for there there are some standard forms um, that you can express mathematically. And for for those standard forms, uh, this typically leads to uh, to uh, threshold rules with proven specific thresholds. So this can for all of those three classes, it can be proven. Uh, so for for the the, the last one, uh, we just uh, have written. That one can just apply the maybe to the defined But here is a, is a puzzling consequence. If we do that, if we are, if we, if we only can, or if the best thing of creating fairness is uh, to to do some group specific uh, decision rules, we have to use uh, the property to which a group a person belongs. And this is totally in contrast to, uh, to, to another uh, uh, thread of thought that says when we want to be fair, we have to ignore, for example, sets. We don't, we don't want to know that we exclude that data from our data set. Um, and um, when we do that, then we have no risk of This is not true, but this is, is really a very popular. Um, Opinion actually, but this is not true, and it's very clear now that this is not true. Ignoring them. On the same time, at the same time, but, uh, both this opinion has been ingrained in legislation. So there are some, some countries in the legislation that don't allow you to use this kind of quotative uh, sense. <clears throat> or the other, protected, what we call protected attributes. Uh, but but the, one of the really the most important uh, results of this, which is actually what we need. Now we have a clash here, it's obviously probably uh, the, the AI people and the legislation fight out. And I know that in Europe, this, this, this is really very important. But ignoring that fairness through non awareness does not work, but that in many cases it makes the situation even worse. Another point is here that without expressing explicit, explicitly addressing these fairness uh, issues, decision rules um, that are used, uh, that are based on predictions that are applied in the decision context, those decision rules are typically problems with all things. So, uh, so this is a standard situation to probably, independent of how we look at that, just all of them. Now, the situation uh, can be done better. You can have, but at the end, you have more, probably all of them with exception of one. Uh, one might think that this is maybe not a big improvement. It, in, in reality, it is a big improvement because, uh, depending on the situation, um, one of those is the one that, that is most justified and should focus on. Okay, um, why are decision algorithms unfair by default? Why can you, can you bet on that? Uh, um, so, of course, one, one easy answer is that hey, I will find some. Uh, but uh, this, is, this, is, this is not the main point. The main point here is that um, uh, the prediction model, one, one important part of it is prediction models. Um, are typically created without considering the decision. So if you look this, uh, at this chain here, uh, the guy, the, the, the data scientist or the machine learner who creates this prediction model does not account for the specific, uh, let's say, way of how the decision is done afterwards. 
problems. This is not how he phrases his problem. Uh, he said, well, I, I want a model that predicts the outcome, but not optimizes it. Make a specific decision scenario or something. Um, I want to make a good prediction. So, so that means those predictions are thought of as being multi-purpose. But of course, um, when you now uh, think that they can be used very differently uh, in terms of decision making, then you can imagine that one way of, of using that maybe might lead to fair outcomes, but it might lead to Second point is that decision making is optimized for decision makers' goal, uh, not of course, is this goal originally never uh, as, as an experiment constrained in. Uh, and uh, as always, uh, when you develop for technology, if you don't have something in your requirements for the development, you might have luck that it comes in anyway, but typically you're not that lucky. This is the main reason for the mechanism. There are some, some other important reasons. One thing that I also, also discussed very much in the literature, but they're, to my opinion, not, not the, let's say, conceptual, most important reasons. One is that um, very often bad data for training the, the prediction model are used. For example, some groups in your training data, some groups have been represented well at all. So it, it's natural that the prediction model is much worse for those. This then transforms into just as um, This happens, but can be dealt with. Um, the, the, and the second part is that um, uh, more conceptual point. Those training algorithms trying to optimize the performance of the prediction model look at something that is called accuracy. How do you do it? Um, and uh, if you have something like an 80% prediction that is achieved, and this is might be maybe a good, uh, good number, then you would, uh, the algorithm does not care whether this 80% is. Uh, is achieved with a part of the population, but not achieved at all for another part, or vice versa. So it is something like, like, a, like a utilitarian way approach. Every person is equal, and I don't care. Uh, this means uh, even now, we're very much in the, the heart of those uh, learning algorithms. We already have the data property, prediction property. And this then leads, for example, uh, to a case that the prediction is well and, 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 and that they have optimized for well, the largest part of the population, but not very many small. Then, if they, they get lost, okay, uh, uh, implications of that. Um, just uh, two final slides here. Who has to care for, for fairness? Uh, and who is responsible for fairness? Uh, the, the, the machine learning literature tends to focus on the prediction model. When you look at the literature, uh, most, most of these papers are entitled, uh, have titles like some fair prediction. So the, the, the I, let's say they suggest that the prediction itself, can be fair. but when we take this, this is this full picture prediction that is plugged into a decision algorithm. We see that the decision maker is finally responsible for decision and, and uh, for the for the fairness. And those those tricks with the different thresholds, for example, for the groups, is something that does not happen uh, at the stage of prediction. It happens at the stage of decision. This can be done at the age of uh, So it's a question whether at all. Uh, machine learner, learner should be made responsible for fairness if that is the decision. Um, from a practical point of view, there is a labor division between people who produce prediction modeling and the other ones who take that and make business with it, for example. So we have also different people who act different, uh, independently, which makes it even harder for a machine learner. Um, so um, the prediction model itself, this is my opinion, cannot be done, uh, made responsible in any reasonable case. It is the decision. On the other hand, 
the decision maker also cannot create terms of law. Assume or consider this judge, this judge just uh, that they just makes those scores. What should this judge? He has no way of, of uh, even determining, let's say, group specific thresholds. This is something that the model knows because he has, he has, he has learned with the time, uh, but the decision makers. So we see it's kind of uh, a very um, delicate interplay of those two roles, something that is basically really not well researched uh, in this research field. And uh, there is something that I'm just, just about uh, digging into that question, uh, trying to systemize that and find more clearly what, what kind of moral implications this thing. We, we already see there is really a big issue which is kind of also. Awesome. Second uh, part, important part here, how to deal with the concept of grants at all. We have seen we have those different approaches. But this is kind of confusing, right? Um, can literature tells us there are uh, 80 different uh, um, uh, ways of defining that, and they have been developed uh, typically from practical problems. People studying a specific problem say, well, that situation, this should be fair. So, so this is what we suggest. Uh, this, this implies that uh, fairness is the um, And there is no such thing that the best fairness criteria. This is really easy to see. Um, but and this also means something that has to do choice. And this choice is not a technical question, it's a moral question, a moral question, which he says which grants practice is the most appropriate for this is it independent is it separation uh, and the reasoning for that cannot come from technology it must come from moral evaluation what are the moral reasons that tell us in this case it, that, it, that it morally justified to find And um, this requires an ethical discourse, uh, and this should not be delegated. So it cannot be delegated um, per se. It cannot be delegated. Conceptually, it should not be delegated. Now, this discourse, if now if, if you talk to the to, to ethicists, for example, they, they are well trained in doing that kind of discourse. But the problem when they do it is that they end up with a kind of moral analysis. Of this does not lead to something that typically gives not a question answer. How should I measure things? If I cannot measure it, I can use a system. So we have those, those mathematical definitions here, we have the ethical considerations here, and we have the um, such that we have something like a structured discourse, ethical analysis methodology that leads to what? Assuming that they are exhaustive, uh, uh, because this is the only thing. And even how to implement all of them is not yet solved. Uh, the right now, maybe these are yeah, like uh, research questions. So uh, that that means we have to interlink this. It wouldn't work. This is what, what we try in our research. That has the chance to deliver some practical solutions, but also this information. Okay, and then the last, last but not least, uh, least uh, this, this discourse has to take into account or to prepare for the situation that there is a decision maker. This decision maker has a legitimate interest in uh, having a good decision. It is also something you cannot discuss about fairness in general, but, but we have to, to make this combination of something that is societally uh, uh, something that we want to achieve, but, but then uh, we have a specific pl uh, player here, very often companies that say, well, here is my interest. We need to have a good decision. 
otherwise um, stop. Uh, what is the time? Okay, I wrap up. Uh, this is just just an outlook on on the on the, the two large projects that we are just currently running here. We see a lot of actors, companies are in there, uh, and we have some different uh, universities. And from the from the from the perspective of the team, we really uh, have set up an interdisciplinary IT guys, philosophers business people trying to, to look at the business really from different angles really at the same time. team here and I thank all of my colleagues for, for their contributions for what we achieved so far. Leave some this approach event. So that I am here. Thanks so much for your attention. On side, and I'm happy to answer any questions. That Yes, yeah, yeah. the actor is different type of errors. And, and one of the, I mean, what I showed uh, in, in this uh, the simple overview is, is only one time of probability, right? Um, with the counter probability as well. And this is the reason why the zoo is so exploding. Um, it, one part is really this, this uh, analysis of what kind of, <clears throat> of uh, also, classification error we might make is more important, and how is this related to the other one? Um, and uh, let's say our current position, but this is a hypothesis actually, is uh, uh, that it's the best way to try to focus uh, one of them based on, on a moral um, analysis uh, and maybe introduce some weighting or something, which is a bit, a bit more complicated. Um, but there are, if, if you try to, to have, let's say, and uh, try to uh, define requirements that uh, require, let's say, false positives and false negatives being, being equal, this ends up with decision rules that are totally false. So probably from a practical point of view, there is, this is also a part of the system. Does this answer your question? Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, that this is actually um, something that is that's also very much discussed. Which, uh, the fact that we base the prediction model on previous outcomes, those previous outcomes might have in it, risking that what we learn is a kind of fair way of doing that, uh, which we then probably in the future or even. Um, this is, um, I mean, this is, this is a tough question, actually, how, how to do that. Um, but, uh, I mean, for specific problems, there are solutions, how to do that. And for example, this, uh, I think this, uh, this, uh, this method with, with the group specific thresholds would not even be very, It would probably also work with some the sense that we described. Uh, just because we, we uh, set those levels such that the outcome we then observe they have. But this is also let's say largely open question. You ready? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. We have some I had some difficulty in here. Anyway, I'd like to thank you very much for this extremely interesting uh, talk that you gave. And I'd like just to make a comment on, um, on uh, what you say about why are decision algorithms unfair by default. You mentioned the fact that when you build up a, a statistical predictive model, um, it should be of, um, related to the decision to the decision system that you are uh, uh, confronting. So um, I completely agree with that, and I want to just to mention that more and more in in uh, recently in statistics uh, there is the idea that uh, you don't be you don't believe anymore on one model that can fit all the whole population that you are considering. So there is a some different approach that partition the population uh, in, a, in a subgroups and try to develop uh, um, prediction models that of course have to be related to the decision, to the particular problem that you are considering. So I, I agree and I think that this is a quite a, a good point for, um, for <laughs> to make a prediction for the decision system. 
thank you really for the yeah, we are working exactly in this, in making a decision system in the medical area. And of course, the, the problem is that you have to face the problem, the, pro the, 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 the decision that a clinician has to take and to make prediction is not just related to have a good system, a good prediction model, but should be a good model to make, to let, to take a decision in term of, um, for, the, for the clinician. I totally agree. I mean, uh, I think it's also from my from my perspective and my experience that the question is, I mean, let's say if if you have the goal in mind for what we do the prediction, uh, then uh, let's say the, the, the parameters on, on which we optimize the prediction model itself, uh, of course, depends on that goal. So, so there's it's uh, okay. Yeah, absolutely. I would support that. And it is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I want to mention because it is a one point that we are taking one way that we are taking, and I think it. I believe that this is the way to do. Thank you. I in the chat. Okay, Maria, I, I read that. Um, interesting talk. Thanks. And now. Are the users of these decision algorithms adequately aware of discussion of discussed biases and how are they currently trained to weight them in their human decision making? If the same algorithms are used among differently populated groups, uh, for example, populated with less white and more non white people or more males than females, do they show some similar biases? Maybe this can fit with the issue of training data. Now, um, if I understand you correctly, so, so thanks for the question. Oh, yeah, if I understand you correctly, uh, you're not talking about the decision. Uh, and uh, what, I mean, it, it is incredibly hard for the decision maker uh, using a prediction model to understand basically how this decision model, uh, how the the way of bias is generated in that in the prediction model and how the decision maker could counteract. I think this is this is really something that is, to my opinion, not really very well explored. And then one way of uh, of our own research actually is to, uh, to try to think about that. For example, what would the decision maker need in terms of additional information? Uh, in addition to the score itself, what would the decision maker need uh, for enabling him or her to, to create a specific way of doing things? This is, I think, a very interesting uh, question that should be answered. Um, we have some hypotheses uh, about that. Uh, and I think it's, it's probably not, not uh, it can be done, at least for restricted set of problems, which then also would, um, would kind of more precisely define the moral obligations for the model make. Because for what, as a, I mean, what we see already right now is that, that the, the one who creates the prediction model has an obligation to give everything to the decision maker that the decision maker needs to create things. Otherwise, it will not work. And this is not addressed uh, today in, in, in all kind of, let's say, Terms where people do prediction models, they just care for accuracy. Nothing else has this information to just be there. So, uh, this is, is my perspective. I hope this is a this part of the question. Okay, thank you so much. And now I see you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> the question? There's one of Andrea Bani. Andrea is a tech research. What is that? We have addressed this privately. Don't see any other. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank
And uh, thank you for your for, for the attendance and I'll see you next time. Next uh, next uh, next week. Next next Friday, yes. Bye bye. Thank you. We have a get together I, here. So I'm sorry for you we can you know that you are online as well. <laughs>